In this edition of Detroit Performs, an inside look at a theater group's half scripted and half improvised performance. The way that this whole thing works is through everyone feeding off of each other, um, support, uh, a creative collaborative environment where people can just play. Critic Card Detroit shares with us more reviews of Detroit events. And something I've been really excited about here at the Demager Fair, just seeing lots of so many great innovators. It's really been inspiring to me. A world-renowned poet and artist whose passion and talent are clear as soon as she enters a room. I don't know, it's really organic. It's not something I try to do. What I try to do is, you know, visually create something. Hey, beautiful people, how y'all feeling? And a glass blower who puts his heart, soul, and sweat into his work. I would say, for myself personally and for most of the glassmakers here at the Corning Museum, you have a very clear picture of what you want to make and you control the glass to create that object. It's all ahead in today's episode of Detroit Performs. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs, everybody. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and I have the pleasure of showing you around the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit. It is the largest museum of its kind in the world. I'll be taking you to different exhibitions throughout today's show. Let's start things out by visiting the Frontalanza Theater Company, whose name says it all. Derived from the Italian word for brotherhood, Frontalanza takes a unique approach to theater that incorporates open collaboration between all members, creating something totally original and one of the best theater experiences in Detroit. Take a look. Do you think I don't know all your pranks? You're dangling after the director's daughter. And that's the first sign of magic. Yeah. Paul and I are brothers. So there's, it's, uh, the story of Fratalanza begins a long, long time ago. We were doing little performances ever since we were young, torturing our family with, by stringing up curtains in the living room and hoisting them up, breaking things in that way. And even though we went away, we both went away to our own places and uh, did other things. We, while we were in those places, Paul was more interested in solo performance and I was doing classical theater in Chicago. We realized that even though we hadn't worked with each other in a long time, we were becoming more and more interested in the same kind of things. And one time we just said, why aren't we doing this together? And that was about two years ago now. And that's why we started doing things together. Fratalanza is a theater company who wants to bring big stories to all kinds of audiences. The way that this whole thing works is through everyone feeding off of each other, um, support, uh, a creative collaborative environment where people can just play. So the show is not something that's completely scripted. It's not something that's completely staged and choreographed. It's constantly going to be changing, so that's really, really exciting because that's not something that just falls into your lap as an artist. So that, that I'm really excited about that aspect of it. This is one, one of my favorite creative projects that I've taken on recently. What we've been doing over the last few weeks is I've been coming to their rehearsals. They have a piano in their space and they'll show me a scene that they've been working on, and then I start improvising based on um, their scene, and so we start improvising together. They're improvising the acting, and I'm improvising the music. 
There could be a little bit of that detail just in maybe the gold chains. Exactly. Anything involved with the material world, I'm sort of fabricating or suggesting or sketching up and throwing at them, and then they respond and see or, or not um, to what I've brought to the table. So, in I guess a distinction between what I'm doing and what a typical sort of set designer, costume designer is that. Um, I've been in dialogue with them about what this production's about from a very early stage, um, and that a lot of the designs of the elements that I'm bringing are influential into in, in what sort of comes about in terms of movement and dialogue on stage. So when we made Fratalanza, we decided that at, at its very heart would be games. So it's not just, hmm, what, a, what is Mozart thinking in this scene? What is the madman thinking in this scene, blah, 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 blah. It's, that's a cool scene. It seems to me that this scene rocks back and forth from one character to another. What else rocks? A boat. Okay, we're on a boat. Let's do it this time, we're on a boat. I'm sitting across from you, we're having dinner, but we're on a boat, and it's a big boat. It's a boat the size of Detroit, and so it rocks real slowly, but it rocks nonetheless. And so during the scene, during the course of the scene, we will rock, and first you're over me, and then I'm over you, and what does that do? And all of a sudden, you have a new dynamic. Now, is the whole show gonna be two actors rocking back and forth, sitting across from a table, drinking imaginary wine? Maybe, but probably not. It's like this is the first time I've been in this space and already we're it's like how can we use that rope? How can we use that basketball hoop? How can we use that that stairwell? How can we just stall people's lives for two hours or an hour and a half? And and present something that is not quotidian. It constantly just makes you want to lean forward instead of um, instead of a more staid approach to theater. Um, I think it, it, it creates something that is incredibly engaging. In Detroit, you get an audience that's awake, that has come to enjoy themselves. You want something to happen that night, not just to present something that's been created in a studio somewhere. You want to, before every show, kind of kick it in the butt so that uh, during the show, as the performance is happening, the actors are happening, not just the characters. We want to be on the frontier of creating that for ourselves and making other people realize that this is a good place to do that. I've, li I've done theater in Chicago, Brussels, Montreal, New York, and I've never seen that ever like I've seen it in Detroit. I can say that confident. To learn more about the Fratalanza Theatre Company and all the artists featured in today's show, visit DetroitPerforms.org. Next up, Credit Card Detroit heads to the Maker Fair. Let's check it out. Hi, my name is Romana Cardin. I'm here at the Detroit Makers Fair. I'm a part of the Goodrich High School Robotics team. And so here today, we are presenting our cupcake car. It was basically just built off an electric wheelchair that was donated to us. And we also have our competition robot and our time machine based off the one in the movie and the motorized spider. And so I've been having a lot of fun today and something I've been really excited about here at the Demager Fair, just seeing lots of so many great innovators. It's really been inspiring to me and it's just been a lot of fun. You can view more Credit Card Detroit Citizen Reviews on their Facebook page and YouTube channel, which you can find through DetroitPerforms.org. Native Detroiter Jessica Care Moore is a world-renowned poet and artist whose infectious spirit creates an energy during performances that leave her audiences truly inspired. We caught up with Jessica at the N. Nambi Center for Contemporary Art as she was preparing for a show in New Center Park based on Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. So I wrote a poem about a tribute to a hero of mine, Jessica Caremore, uh, because it's rare that we find people celebrate African-American women uh, when they think of 
people to celebrate. And uh, I wrote this poem because I was inspired by the work that she does, the life that she lives, the message that she sends out. And it's called Hero. Some look for their heroes in history books or the fictitious accounts of comic strips. But my hero is alive and real, a woman. And she wears her cape around her hips. When you walk over glass like water, when you know your eyes are borrowed like time, when you peel off your skin for the very first time, fear is never in style in the Mecca of the blue. I want people to come out to see poetry. You know, at the, at my, you know what I mean? My show is a poetry show. If you take all the band away, I'm reading poems, and I actually read poems. Like they're not even all memorized. Like I come out with my book, or I have my my papers, and I'm with the band, just like that. You know, and some of it is on purpose, just to show people that I'm a writer. Because sometimes, if you're performing, people just look at you only as a performer. And my craft definitely starts with the writing first. So the writing has to be good. And then I figure out how do I translate this into a performance. And I'm a woman on the mic. So that's why the performance part comes because I'm a woman on the mic. So a woman on the mic can't be quiet, not, in, not within, within our generation, because they just go, Psh, oh, she sounds so sweet. So my voice is heavy. And that used to be a problem when I was little. But when I started performing a poem in front of people, the heaviness of my voice caught their attention. It's like, oh, because she doesn't sound soft like a girl. And so I use, I use all of that. Um, to help get people to, to pull them in. I'm a body of clocks. I'm a master of mice. I'm a metaphor for survival. I'm the dog they use to build their tribe. When I first met Jessica, our first performance, I just thought, uh, first, you know, being of the, uh, being one of the baby boomers and one of the older group of baby boomers, you know, spoken word was not my first music experience. So, but when I went to one of her concerts, it, it, it was such a, an experience because she had spoken word, blues, jazz, all of them combined in one performance. And I just thought, wow, she has something here. Jessica is definitely a rock star. And uh, her show, she does poetry, she does music. Being that I'm inspired by art of all forms, I thought that was something that was very potent about Jessica's work is that it's, it's, it exists in written form and lives in visual forms and, you know, in, in music. And uh, that was very motivational for me because I try to, to not stay stifled and stagnant in one form of artwork. If there's no energy, then you can't perform. Like, if I'm in a room that has no energy, it's hard for me to get through a performance. It becomes probably not a good performance. But if people are excited that I'm there, then I'm excited that they're there, and then there's this exchange that happens. I don't, it's really organic. It's not something I try to do. What I try to do is, you know, visually create something. Hey, beautiful people, how y'all feeling? Hi. Everything's on purpose, from my hat to whatever dress I decide or to wear or not to wear, so how I'm looking. But, yeah, energy, spirit, because everyone's not gonna understand poems anyway. You know, I've been in Berlin performing for like thousands of people on Potsdamer Platz, an international poetry festival, and I'm like, they're not going to understand my pop references. They're not going to get it all. It's going to be like, what? But they understand energy. So even if you're bi and trilingual, understanding context and you know, pop references, they're not going to get it. But they did. And they understood and felt, if people can feel you, that's almost better than if they can understand you. You know what I mean? They can always go back and look it up or go, you know, find, if there's a word they didn't understand or there's a reference, you can find that. But if you could feel it, then that's, yeah, that's the point. What's up, Detroit? You really don't usually find an artist that is so giving, but at the same time are into their own craft, you know, and that's, that's what I think one of her major pluses is, and one of her makes her really a jewel for our city. You know, Jessica is a walking poem. Her, her work is a representation of her life. Um, she, you know, writes about the city that she's from, and interacts in the city that she's from. She, you know, writes about love, and she's a loving person in real life. Detroit is um, in my work. I, I moved to New York uh, for 12 years. I, I was away from Detroit, um, New York. Went to Brooklyn and Harlem, and 
and made a name for myself there as an artist. And then I went to Atlanta, and by then I was already known. But you know, when I started traveling internationally, every time people say, they would say New York poet, and I would correct them. I would say, No, I'm a Detroit poet, and that's really important for me, like the identity piece, because people uh, misinterpret our city a lot. So as an artist, um, you know, I do believe the artists truly are the historians of the time. Like I have to be clear about how I feel about my city and. It's ingrained in my work, you know, no matter, even God is Not an American, my third book that I finished here, when I came home, that book came out in 2009, so I'd moved back home in, in 2008. And I couldn't have written that book if I wouldn't have come home. But even when I was in New York and Atlanta, I was still writing about Detroit, I, you know, and I love Detroit. I just, uh, I'm hoping I don't run out of stages. <laughs> that becomes the thing. Like, even when I was in Atlanta as an artist, I just, I came to Atlanta as a New York, you know, a New Yorker from Detroit. And I was like, okay, I want to perform there. And I just pointed to the places that I wanted to perform. And once I was done, I was kind of like, well, I did Atlanta. Now I got to do something else. And coming home, I got to rediscover my city again. Brown eyes, deep brown eyes and 12 hands. Carry her children back in charge. Jamila wings, stress, OT, future, pocketbook, and temper. Up the sticky stairs of the subway station. I can't help myself at this point. Like, I don't. You know, I think as a poet, I look at the world in a, a specific way. When I watch the news, when I see people on the street, you know, whether they're begging for change or they're riding the bike, I'm, I'm a watcher. So I'm always paying t attention to people, even when they don't know I'm paying attention. So it's uh, a part of me and to, be, to create something out of that. I like telling stories. I love writing. I love to write. I, don't, I can't imagine not doing it, even if I didn't make money doing it. I would find a way, I would still write. <laughs> I would just maybe teach or, I don't know, go get a job doing something. I don't know what, I want to be like a soft rock radio DJ or something, I don't know. Some look for their heroes in history books, looking for people that were, but my hero is Jessica Care Moore, and I can't spell hero without her. To learn more about Jessica Care Moore and the N90 Center for Contemporary Art, visit DetroitPerforms.org, where you can also see Brandi Keeler recite her poem about Jessica in its entirety. And now, here's some upcoming events happening around Detroit. Eric Meek has been creating art out of glass for nearly 20 years and is considered a master of his craft. Next, we see how Meek crafts his vibrant but fragile works of art. I started blowing glass when I went to college. I signed up for a course just because it was available. I thought it would be a, an interesting thing to try and something I may never have an opportunity to do again. I kind of just started to do it out of curiosity. You know, I'd known a little bit about glass making. But I really wanted to experience it for myself, and when I had the opportunity, I went ahead and tried it. I started working at the Corning Museum of Glass in the summers, and that's been about, about 12 years ago. And then I started working full-time about eight years ago. My name is Eric Meek. I'm a master glass blower here at the Corning Museum of Glass, and I also supervise the glass making demonstrations. A gaffer is a term that's historically been used here in Corning for the master glassmaker. Uh, gaffer is a term of respect. To, from what we understand, it's a British term. So if you go to a job site in Great Britain still today, if you ask for the gaffer, you'll get the foreman. The Corning Museum of Glass is over 60 years old now, and it's really the world's greatest collection of glass. The Corning Museum would be at home in any major city in the world, and it really has an encyclopedic collection of glass that's been made throughout history, throughout the 4,000 year history of glass. To me, the, the museum is first and foremost a historical collection, uh, including just amazing, beautiful, inspiring pieces. I think a lot of people come to the Corning Museum of Glass also to, to watch glass making demonstrations. So Eric's melted this out and he's shaping this up and in a moment what you're going to see is he's going to blow a little bit of air into the pipe, trap that air in the pipe with his thumb, 
And then watch that glass. It actually expands a little bit. You know, glass making is something that, that because it is so mysterious, so unique, that it's a lot of fun to watch. The pace of it is fun to watch. The, the dynamic change is fun to watch. And then a lot of our visitors come to actually make glass themselves. We have the opportunity here at the museum for people to make glass themselves, which is unusual. Making glass in front of a live audience is always energizing. It's always fun to have people observe what you do and admire what you do, and you kind of feed off of that. As far as you know, being nervous or anything, I think glass makers, once you start the process, you're, you're pretty much totally focused on that. You kind of lose yourself in the process, so if you're doing something difficult, kind of the audience, for me anyway, just goes away. You don't really notice them. But you know, when you have time to focus on it, or time to think about it, you know, it's often nice to see people sitting there smiling, enjoying what you're doing. The Corning Museum of Glass is unique in that we do really great demonstrations. We love to share glass making with our visitors. That really goes beyond the walls of the museum too. We've developed portable shops that we blow glass with uh, literally around the world. We have studios that we can travel with that we take across the, the country and around the world. And we're even blowing glass on three different cruise ships right now. The Corning Museum has become known for professionally presenting glass making demonstrations. We explain what we do, we're passionate about what we do, uh, we love to share what we do. And so I'm really proud that the museum is known for that, That's, they're known for putting on great demonstrations to give people a real understanding of what it's like to work with glass. To be successful in this medium, in any, any medium, you have to be a technician first, and that means controlling the glass. A lot of times you'll hear people who are just starting to, to blow glass say, oh, we just kind of let the glass do what it wanted to do. That's great for learning. If you're a professional, you have to be able to work with the glass to control the outcome of the glass. So I would say for myself personally and for most of the glass makers here at the Corning Museum, you have a very clear picture of what you want to make and you control the glass to create that object. The process of making glass, like any other creative pursuit, begins with an idea. So you have to have a vision of what you want to create. And then, to support that vision, you have to have the, the skills to do it. When I approach making a piece of glass, I visualize it in my mind. I usually don't draw it out, I usually just visualize it in my mind. And then I think of, of you know, what I've done in the past that would help me create that object. What way of applying color, technique that I saw a master glassmaker use that I wanted to try or to employ. Or I walk through the museum and I get inspired by the pieces here and I think, well, how would I create that piece? And you know, you visualize it in your mind. The first path of starting a piece is to actually visualize it and to sort of run through it in your mind. The Corning Museum of Glass this, this year was challenged to make the trophy for the, the NASCAR race up at Watkins Glen. We wanted to make something that would signify the region, that would signify the track, you know, that would have special significance to the track. And so really over about a, a nine month period, I worked with the fellows from the, the Watkins Glen track to develop the, um, the sort of iconography that we wanted to use in the piece. It's a lovely piece, I'm very proud of it. It has the profile of the track in the top of the trophy, and from the side it kind of looks like a waterfall. It's a beautiful blue color, which is a color that's unique to that track. They use it to paint their guardrails. So we have the blue color, but when you look at the trophy, it, it almost looks like a waterfall. So we have the waterfall from the glen, we have the outline of the track, we have an iconic color, and it's glass. So glass is also very important to the history of our region. Uh, with Corning Glassworks and Corning Incorporated and the museum now. Really the texture of the material would surprise people most. It, it's unexpected about glass. A lot of other materials that you see people create with, wood or clay, we all have a personal connection with. No one is really, until you try working with molten glass, no one really knows uh, what the material is like. So I think First, first of all, that's something that's very surprising about glass, just that it's, it's an unusual material, it's unlike anything else. The thing about glass making that is unique is that every moment you're working with it, it changes. So it begins very soft and fluid, and then sometimes in a matter of just seconds, it, it hardens into something that's basically as hard and brittle as glass is at room temperature. So we're working with a range of, of textures and viscosities in a range of temperatures, and that's really, uh, really the challenge about glass making, and I think the thing that's most unexpected about it. I think something that strikes a lot of people when they watch a glass maker is just the physicality of it, the heat, the weight. Uh, 
that you must be dealing with. You see this 2,000 degree furnace and their glass makers are standing right in front of it. And I think a lot of people wonder if that, if that affects you, if that affects um, you know, when you're working, if that's something that it, that's in your mind. But you really do get, you become accustomed to the heat, you become accustomed to, to the physicality of making glass. And a lot of people love it. A lot of people love working with glass because of those elements, because of, because of its hard work. And you're, and you're sweating, um, but I really enjoy that. To see more of Eric Meek's work at the Corning Museum of Glass, visit DetroitPerforms.org. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. For more information on arts and culture, visit DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. Also, don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. We'd like to thank the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History for letting us come by and discover and learn what they had to offer. they also like you to come by and check out the museum for yourself. Until next time, get out there and show them how Detroit performs. I am DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.